Hi, I'm Tony Riddle, and this is the Nat Life Pod, a platform for conversation to help close the gap between wellness as an industry and wellness as a state of being. Big shout out to this episode's sponsor, XL Coffee. XL are renowned organic coffee producers here in the UK who have gone to extraordinary lengths to ensure their coffee is mold free and has kept its antioxidant potency. XL are waking up the world of coffee. I'm a big fan and recommend you go give them a try. Use discount code NatLifePod at checkout. Details are in the show notes. On this episode of the NatLife Pod, I'm behind the mic with Stevie Ward. Stevie Ward is a former professional rugby player who played in one of the most successful teams in Super League history. We unpack Stevie's journey from the curious kid picking up a rugby ball for the first time to then becoming the youngest grand final winner ever and being named captain at just 26 years of age. We then go on to unpack the injuries, the mental health issues and the brain injury that led to Stevie retiring from rugby at just 27 years of age. Through his ups and downs, his wins and what was being perceived as losing in life, Stevie has birthed a belief that the truest form of resilience is to realise the potential of our true selves. Stevie is doing great work for the community through Mentality, which he launched in 2016. Mentality is a platform for inspiring conversation around mental health for men and offers counselling and life coaching services. He's doing great work out here. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. And remember, peeps, you can help close the gap between wellness as an industry and wellness as a state of being by liking, commenting and sharing this pod. Much love to you, you beautiful custodians of this beautiful planet we call Earth. Stevie Ward. How are we? Hey, we're we're here? good, man. We're here. Well, we've been here. Well, you've been here since last night. I've been here a long while. You, 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 yeah, you've embraced me. You've, you've, you've brought me into your home, mate, and into my probably, world. Yeah, into your world. And you've probably seen me coming this morning, coming into the door, and you, you've been doing your rehab and your movement and stuff like that. And it was a nice, well, I say nice education, but actually, it's more of a relearning, a remembering, a remembering. Yeah, yeah. You know, of of how to move after. How many years of being in a linear process, doing the bodybuilding stuff to be a rugby player, you know, like it's been quite a, yeah. it's been quite nice to drop back into it and to go past the moments where in my mind I'm like, I've had five operations on this knee. Is this going to move properly? Is this going to, you know, this shoulders yanking yeah. around and yeah. it's been nice to, to wake my body back up. You well, know? I guess tap into the true understanding of what functional movement is. Yeah. Rather than perhaps what you've been taught as functional, but actually it's led to dysfunction in mm. a sense. It's performative in a way, what I learned, isn't it? Performative, <clears> but <throat> there's many different variations of how that could have been. Yeah, but as we spoke to this morning, there's the, um, we're straight in, you realise that? Yeah. Right? Just boom, let's get in. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, no foreplay sorry, here. We're just straight in. <laughs> yeah. um, What's it all about? Yeah, like the, what we were saying: the more complex movements are only as good as the foundational movements. And then mm. looking at your foundational movements this morning, mm. you know, and then the understanding of the elite level where you've been at, mm. and then the crossovers. I was discussing. I've seen it in rugby. I've seen it in football. I've seen it in boxing, mm. and it's fascinating that world. You know that no one's really looking at the real foundational movement of how we even got to stand up in the first place, which is complex, and then to run. What else is in rugby, right? You're throwing. Mm. As we discussed, like even simple crawling patterns, what that would have been like if you incorporated yeah. that, you know, into that world. Yeah, all the times, all the times, mate, I've got up off the floor in the gym and I'm manoeuvring around these aches and these pains, you know, and these reduction in flexion in my joints and... But we've, you know, we played with simple things this morning. It's like four movements, mm. and already there's more range in there, right? Yeah, there's more comfort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you had to play with the edges to discomfort, right? <laughs> oh, too right, mate. But I like it. I like that discomfort. You well, know? we talked. We we were in the sauna. Well, we went in the sauna. Yeah. We had a cold plunge as well this morning. Mm. 
as well as that mobility in front of the fire. And even in there, what was it? I I I like the what, 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 suffering of it. I like to be in the suffering. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, is that something you're familiar with then? I'm that familiar suffering? with that, yeah. Yeah. In many different variations, I imagine. Mm. Lessons in there though, right? Lessons, lessons in who you actually are, what mm. you actually can be, past that threshold of your mind telling you that mm, maybe that ain't you, maybe you don't want to do that, maybe you, you know, all those sort of things that can keep you around the periphery of it all. Yeah. The suffering is everything, you know. The ability to sit in that and, you know, I think about my career, mate, and I think about the running drills you do, the conditioning you do, and and you go till your lungs are going to collapse, you know, you go till the end. Mm. And I might not have been the quickest at the drill, but, you know, the younger lads... By the time I was captain, 25, 26, they'll be off the mark quicker, they'll be turning quicker. But come the mid, the mid part of it, I'm just still going. I'm still, I'm still feeling that pain. I'm still all right with that pain. And they might drop off. And ultimately, that's what it's about, really, isn't it? And, mm. and being able to keep going and to keep performing and being all right with that, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I saw a. I saw a post the other week and it was talking about the Navy SEALs and it's like, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's around the same percentage, 2% of the Navy SEALs. There's only 2% of people that, that get in, that pass out from the Navy SEALs, you know. Um, and about 85... The minority of the minority of exactly. the minority, right? Yeah, and 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 most of those those people that pass through that become a Navy SEAL they have adverse childhood experiences, mm. you know? So I, I'm like, where do you do the real training, you know? Where do you do the real training? Is it is it in the stuff when you're 19, you know, growing up and you're trying to develop that mental toughness? Or is it an ability to sit in discomfort when you're younger, when there's trauma, mm. you know? And, and I think about my life and looking back at it, I look, I look for, for why why did I keep going? Why did I keep pushing? Why did I keep driving in this career? This career that ultimately I feel like there was a drive in me that was that was bigger than my body could handle sometimes, you know? My shoulders would be smashing to bits, my knees would be capitulating. And I think about, you know, where, where that comes from. And I, I, I think about when I was younger and walking into... My house coming back from school, my mum coming back from, from work and my mum had a, a really tough upbringing. She had a tough job actually. Um, and a lot of the time I'd come into the living room, my mum would be sat in the corner of the living room and she'd have this ruminating face, you know, mm. this like distressed and worried face. In process. In process, mate. Yeah, she, just, just something's going on for her. And me as a young child... I'm going into the room and I'm walking on eggshells a little bit. You know, I'm a bit like, fucking, what what do I do here? Like, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's what, this is partly with looking at Gab Almaty's work. And I think the safest thing for me there was instead of saying, oh, what's wrong with my mum? You know, this person who's looking after me, that's caring for me, that, that loves me, what's wrong with this this person, this guardian? safest thing was to say like what's wrong with me mm. and I think I mean, there's so many times in my career where I think I revisited that through the injuries that I got you know through having to sit out on the sideline through feeling like am I not tough enough to to be okay here, to be training am I not tough enough to stay on the field what's wrong with me you know mm. And it's like anything. It's there's, there's there's the good and the bad, and there's the the light and the dark, and there's a lot of pain that drove me to to do what I did. And I, I, don't, I don't think in, in in sport we we think about that, or we we provide an environment where we accept that, acknowledge it, 
celebrate it, you know. Mm. I, I, I don't I don't think we're there yet. Well, I don't think we're there with many things within sport. Mm. You know, physical, social, spiritual. Spiritual is even a conversation in sport. And emotional intelligence, even the intuition that drops in, as we were discussing earlier, mm. and that doesn't feel right in training. Mm. You know, this doesn't feel right yet. You're, no, you need to be doing this. This yeah. is what you need to be doing, and yeah. it's pushing you beyond perhaps beyond the edges of discomfort into mm. something that could be detrimental even, right, or be compromising you. Yeah. Um, when did you per first pick up a rugby ball? I remember being at my childminders, you know, in and around the hectic journey to school. I go to my childminders and I, and I go to school and then I come back on the evening and, and I can remember going out onto onto the grass, into the back garden and the next door neighbour was playing a rugby ball. My mum and dad were bikers. They met on a, a biking rally, actually, motorbikes. Okay. So they met, you know, my dad's from Salford, my mum's from Ireland and they, that's how they met. They didn't really pay much attention to rugby but as soon as I saw this rugby ball next door well I was just it was just I was just drawn to it mm -hmm. it was just, it, it was it was not even a consideration you know we're talking about homeschooling and and, and allowing kids to be led by their heart to what their curiosity curiosity that full curiosity mm. and I can remember picking up this ball Going down to the amateur team that that my next the the next door neighbour to my childminder went to, and I remember, mate, I remember the the feeling of it. I've got this visceral memory of catching the ball and gravitating towards this defensive line in front of me. You know, of of in my mind, were big angry men that wanted to grab me, throw me to the ground, and smash me to bits. You know, I've got I've got this feeling that. Even though there's that fear and trepidation, I'm like moving towards it. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm going towards this line. And I get into touching distance of this line and naturally I'd veer towards my right, you know, just running sideways along the front, the front edge of this line. And just before I run out of time, I'm shaping my body's up to the sky and I stamp my right foot down, you know, and I cut into it. And there's that moment, you know, where you're holding the ball, you're bracing the contact, you're closing your eyes a little bit and you're like hoping that every part of you gets through to the other side of this line, you know? And and this is like when I knew, this is when it was like, I'd feel that sense of freedom because I'd start to feel these arms trailing on my waist, you know, these fingernails scragging at my neck to pull me back. But I'd start to feel my weight transferring to the other side of it. I put my foot down and I'd, I'd, I'd knock my head back. And I'd just see the end, I can remember the endless blue skies just rolling into green fields of me, in front of me. And going back to my mum, I remember this clear as day. My mum from the touchline screaming, Go on, Stevie! You know? How'd you be full of it then? Just mm. confident, be full of it, full of love, full of exploration, you know, full of adventure, like freedom. Mm. And I'd act on a daydream that I'd had four days before in maths class. And this was the time to put it into action. I'd, I'd swagger up towards this fullback, the last line of defence between me and the try line. I'd get to him, I'd drop the ball on my foot, I'd knock it over the top of his head, run outside, I'd catch it. And I'd sprint home. I'd sprint home. I get to the try line and I'd, I'd swan dive over it, you know, and I'd use the balls, my landing gear, and I'd I'd skid to a stop, you know. And there's that moment there, just on your front, lying on your front with with the ball underneath you. There's that smell of thick, juicy mud, you know. I just have that feeling that everything's just right here. It's all all right. It's all all right. Everything. You know, and then you stand up and you see your teammates running towards you, like wide-eyed, like jumping for joy, you know. Like, How good is this? Mm. How good is it? And I'm like... Phew. And do you know all I had to do for that to, to happen? We just take a step forward. Mm. Take a step forward. I didn't plan it. I didn't think about it. I didn't overthink it. 
I didn't think this is what I need to do. And, and there's so many things in there, mate. You know, was I driven by the love for my mum? Was I driven by the curiosity of it, the, end, the adventure of it? And I remember we used to have a chant, you know, like you have the the the, the, the English version of the hacker, you know, we, mm. we stretch as far as to say one, two, three warriors or one, two, three raiders, you know, before a game. Yeah. But I remember, I remember our chant, I must have been eight or nine years old. My team was Cheerwell Chiefs. That's what they were called. And my old head coach passed down this, it was like this rites of passage for me to take over the chant. Because what my role would be, would be to scream the question, who are we? I was screaming it. And my full team would reply, Joel. And I'd be like, oh, oh, oh. Mm. full team would be like, Joel. <clears throat> Play tribal that, right? Tribal, mate. And, it, and you know, Joel, it's, it's a part in Leeds, a small part of Leeds in, in, mm. in Morley. But it wasn't about Joel. It was like us as this group in one moment of time, going against this team who want to, well, they want to beat us, they want to run over the top of us, mm. they want to hurt us. Smash you. Smash us to bits. Mm. But there's a lot of acceptance in it as well, you know? It's like, yeah. Well, you're properly going into battle, aren't you? That's yeah. kind of the connection and, to that, right? Yeah, and, and you know, sometimes when I do my keynote talks now and I'm out there and talking about my experience... I bring up the hacker, you know, the, the Kiwis doing the hacker, the, the All Blacks doing the hacker. And it's, you know, it's a war dance. Half of it is to scare the opposition. But a lot of it is to invite the spirits, mm. to invite people outside of them, to invite something bigger than themselves to come in to, to help them. Which brings that spiritual piece in, right? which is, is is completely integrated into what they do. Mm. And originally in the 1800s, it was, it, was, it was written through an old warrior, you know, running away from a tribe that was attacking his tribe, 1800s, and he's, he's running away, you know, he's in fear, he's scared. And he, 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 he holds himself up in this ditch and he's there and he's and he's he's, he's scared scared to death mm. literally scared to death so he gets his pen out and he's writing you know like kamate kamate oh he's writing which is in english is it's death it's death you know he's ready he's, he's ready for death mm. the enemy tribe run past that hole and he writes it's life it's life another upward step and he gets out climbs out of the ditch and he's ready to go again I'm like, mm. sends tingles, right? Can can you? What's that place? That that that. It's a resilience where there's nothing to lose, mm. you know, because he's lost. He's already lost the fear. He's already lost the well, nothing to lose. Also, everything to gain in yeah. that moment. Yeah. And that's where that that you know we're still seeing it today, and everyone gets tingles when they watch it. Everyone thinks there's something going on beyond what we can set our mind to. Mm. <clears throat> you know, in my career, it was it was a crash course of probably the, I'd say, one of the toughest and most brutal sports that there is. And it's so easy to get lost in the ego of it, so easy to get lost in the bravado of it. Well, the I and lose the we aspect yeah. of it, and part of that hacker as well is like the the collective bonding that comes through that almost ritualistic dance. Yeah. That the energies that are brought in and invited in in that moment, right? And yeah. Now we see through a lot of sport, it's almost like headphones on, walk to the bench, totally disconnected in your own world mm. rather than what would be a real sense of coming together yeah. Yeah. in unity. You know? It's completely opposite if you think mm. about it. Isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. Going insular. Yeah. When actually you're all going out as a team to do something pretty serious and depends how you see it to pretty work brutal. off each other's energy in that sense right yeah yeah and to feel supported and safe mm. you know like a so much safety in it as well that's needed in so, what you say is like the arguably one of the 
toughest sports, right? Mm. What's the what? Because for those that I'm, I sometimes get confused like this, and Simon and I were discussing, right? League, League and union. union, you know. <laughs> yeah, I knew it was coming. <laughs> All right, let me just go back to the old filing yeah. cabinet of the rules that are yeah, yeah. different. Because um, I know there's a difference in number of players, right? Yeah. 15 union, yes. 13 league. Yeah. In league, so obviously in union there's phases, so it just continuously goes. You, you could keep the ball forever if you wanted to, but obviously there's kicking involved and people, the other team can rip it. In league, there's only five tackles. Otherwise, you have to turn the ball over. So you get you go through five tackles and then you kick it down to the other end. And it's very much a territorial game of attrition, really, mm. in the league. 13 players. It's um, a faster pace. Faster. Yeah. 10 metres. So whenever whenever gets someone gets tackled, the defensive team will always sprint back 10 metres to then again come up and belt the other team after a 10 metre sprint mm. whereas in rugby union you make the tackle and all the players stay in line with the tackle there's not as much retreat there's not as much getting up and down so league is it's, it's it, league is a lot more physically demanding I don't think that's controversial to say league okay. is a lot more um, you know I'd make back in 2015 I'd make an average of 45 50 tackles a game that's so we could call that collisions. Collisions, proper collisions, yeah. you know. Um, and then there's the taking to fall, there's the getting up, there's the sprinting back, there's the sprinting back forward again to make the other tackle. And it's like continuous, you know. In Union, you know, I see it, I see it on the commentary in, in Rugby Union, they're like, oh, he's made nine tackles today. I'm like, what? <laughs> wow. I'm like, I should have gone and played Rugby Union when I was a bit younger, you know what I mean? <laughs> save the shoulders, save the body, but... Yeah, that's that's the main difference. But union, mate, in terms of the international game, is it's a lot more, it's a lot more global. You know, there's a lot more attention on the, mm. the international game. Well, I guess it's probably the opposite in rugby league, to be honest. And so, what age did you enter kind of high at that high level? <sighs> mate, I remember signing full time when I was sixteen, and I sort of juggled my A levels. Um, alongside full-time training. So I'd go to the gym at 6 a.m., go back and do a full day of school and then go back on the evening to train again. And it was like, it was a real introduction to like, you're growing up now, mate. You mm. know, you, it's all on now. And so there was a bit of time on that. I made my debut at 18. And it was like, a, I was probably living the dream when, Maybe I should have still been dreaming it, really, because I made my debut at 18 and um, that first year I played at standoff, which is sort of like the fly half in rugby union, if, if, for your frame of reference. Played at standoff at Wembley in front of 80,000 people um, in the Challenge Cup final, um, like the Rugby League's FA Cup, really. Um, and you're 18. I was 18 years old. Mm. And I just, it was the week after I'd collected my A-level results, actually. So I'm like into the, into the furnace with that, you know, I'm like, and I remember going into the, the changing rooms at Wembley and they're massive, these changing rooms are massive, you know. And I'm looking around at, what were my childhood heroes, by the way? You know, Rob Burrow, Kevin Sinfield, Jamie Peacock, Danny Maguire, all these like titans of the game, these gladiators that I'd watched growing up. I'm in this changing room with them all. Having this I've surreal just, moment. Yeah. What the? I've only just got over being starstruck. This is like my fourth game. Mm. And I'm picking up so many different things from all these different characters. You know, you've got Rob Burrow, who's one of the funniest guys that I've ever met. Kevin Sinfield, who's a dedicated professional. Jamie Peacock, who stand up doing the power stance just before you're about to go out. He's like, all right, we're fucking time to give it to these boys, you know, it's time to give it to these men. And, you know, you're 18 and you're just soaking things up. Mm. And I remember, you know, there's people standing, looking in the mirror, like just before we're going out, beads of sweat coming down the red. People throwing up in the toilet, 
And I remember going to the toilet, sitting down, shutting the, the, the toilet cubicle door and just gathering myself, you know, I was just like, fucking wow. I was nervous, mate. I was that nervous. I was probably dizzy, you know. And I'm sat there and at this moment in time and... and 18 years old, I'd, I'd sort of, growing up, I'd been dubbed as the next Kevin Sinfield, actually, growing up, you know, sometimes I get called Stevie Wonder, and that's not because I was dropping balls, it was because, you know, I was, oh, he's a wonder kid, this lad, you know, this this lad growing up, and it, but then it'd be the next Kevin Sinfield, and, you know, when, you, when you're in the academy, I was getting nicknamed Kev, and you're growing up, and it's very much a moment where you're figuring stuff out, you know, you're figuring yourself out, or you're trying to remain self, mm -hmm. But being labelled. But being labelled someone yeah. else, you know? And I'm like, what do I do here? Do I do, do I need to play more like Kev? Do, you know, do I need to be, be more like him? You know, what what do I need to do here to, to be successful? Because mm. that's all I was, there was no other, I was all in, you know? I was absolutely all in. And I remember sort of in and around 18, that age, and sometimes... You're going into a game and you're thinking more and you're, you're in your mind more, you're in your head and you're sort of like, what is this? You know, what do I need to do here? I'm playing this new position where I'm passing more. And and Kev was very much a tactician and he'd pass, he'd kick and, and it'd be a much, much more thought out. And I'm sat on this toilet a few minutes before I go out into the biggest game of my life. And um, I look down at the floor and there's this this piece of paper that's passed underneath the toilet cubicle door <laughs> in this scrap of paper and it's got this scruffy handwriting on. And I pick it up. I think, can't even poo in peace here. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> can't even poo in peace here. And I pick it up and it just says, Stevie, you always run first. You get involved in the action. And then everything happens from there. You'll go well today. You're a tough C word. I don't know if I can say that. Mm. Maybe not on here. But yeah. yeah. Everyone, everyone knows. Yeah. You're See tough, you tough. next Tuesday. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I pick it up and I'm like, yeah, of course. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, of course. It's like a note to self. Mm. Note to self. Was it signed by anyone? Yeah, uh -huh. Brian Mack, our head coach, mate, and he'd give me my debut. He'd put me, he'd picked me, and he was an ex-Royal Marine, ex-boxer, mm. ex-rugby player, and now he's a, a, a rugby league head coach who was tasked with the, the, the job to get us over these opponents, get us through these finals, and he was the most successful Super League coach there is. And he, he was a man who, this hard exterior, you know, really hard exterior, didn't do small talk but he was rigidly authentic, mm. rigidly authentic. And he could connect emotionally with you. Mm -hmm. Even if you went out of the office thinking, why has he said that to me? He's wrong. He'd say it to you straight. And I knew where I was with that, you know, that bit piece, of, piece of paper that's got passed under the toilet cubicle door. There's no doubt. There's fear, yeah, but... I don't have to do anything, think anything up to get around this fear, you mm -hmm. know? Great coaching. Great coaching, yeah. Well, to see it, it probably recognised immediately. Stevie's gone in the toilet and mm. maybe looked at your body language. Yeah. You know, know. And under the door it goes. And who knows where I'd be now if I didn't have that? Mm. No idea, do you? Yeah, that's it gets it gets very complicated at times in the sporting world. You know, it gets very stressful. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of a lot of shame as well, you know. Well I think as you're speaking to there's some, you know, experienced players there, yet what they're going through emotionally before going out, because as you say, it's one of the toughest sports 
mm. could say the toughest sport and you are going out to battle mm. and then it's then parking well what about other stuff that could be happening outside of that changing room yeah what about the you know the conversation that might have happened with whoever yeah. partner relationship you know what's mm. going on with business what's going on with health mm. didn't sleep mm. you know everything else and then bam you're in a changing room and you're about to go out and perform yeah it's pretty final in it it's you know pretty... <clears throat> you know we did a bit of breathing before getting on the podcast right <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean what because you know what are, what are the tools and modalities from that coaching side are taught really outside of the changing room and off the pitch um, what, I'm not, I'm what is in the... place you know outside of the even the gym you know if we talk about dealing with the stresses or what can be the emotions that that the player is feeling. There wasn't a lot back then. And uh, I think that's why for me, you know, you're playing at Wembley when you're 18, you're playing at Old Trafford when you're 18, when you lost, when you win, out of these operations, come back, I was still in pain. I wasn't playing to the potential of how I knew I could play, the potential of how others knew I could play, you know? And it, for me, it was like, I'd always had this fight. I was winning, you know, always winning this fight, but I'd started losing it. Mm. I don't know what to do. I'm losing, you know, I didn't know what to do. And I'm, I'm at this part of my life where the chips are down and uh, I felt like I didn't emotionally or have the tools to be able to deal with where I was you know it was easy for me to just be out on the field and just give it everything I'd always done it you know but when when I had to f sit and feel and also not know if that was okay. Mm -hmm. That was that was a challenge and that was a test and I did I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was happening. And back then there wasn't much talk on, on mental health. There wasn't much talk on it. And I remember getting another injury and, and I'd 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 gone through this phase where I'd got all over these injuries. I got back on the field. I'd got back into form. I was wrestling. I was challenging. I was competing and I was the testosterone through the roof, you know, and I'm back into it and we're winning again and we win at Wembley and, and, and I'm sort of like in this mode where, do you know what? It's just hard work, this. It's just hard work. That's all it is. Hard work, discipline. I beat depression. You know, that's what I was thinking. And I remember... You know, I'm at this at this moment in time, towards the back end of the season, I'm getting jabs in my shoulders. I'm getting my calf strapped up, and I remember going to 2015. I remember the year was me back in form. You know, back playing and overcome all that stuff. Well, how old are you? In, uh, how old are you then? 21. Okay, 21. I'd had meteoric rise at 18. 19, 20 injuries, poor form, in and out of the team. And then 2015, I'm back into it and I'm like, right, okay. Feeling back to the I'm 18 to, yeah. to 19 successes. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm back. This is all you need to do to, for your life to be good, you know? Mm. Um, and I remember seeing my nana, actually. Um, she, was, she was dying with melanoma through 2015. So that year, I had both sides of the spectrum where I'd be training, winning, smashing things, being a 21-year-old lad. And then the other side of the spectrum is me going over and seeing my nana in Salford in this tiny little flat with these big vicious tumours on her face. And then looking across and seeing these pictures of my nana and granddad when they're happy and they're healthy and, you know, that feeling where you get whacked in the nose and everything in you is like, don't cry, don't cry, you know? Mm. I'm like, well, what's what's going on here? And we skip forward to the end of the 
end of the the season where this year would would been would aimed up to win three trophies. Treble would would aim, aim to do something that was deemed physically impossible, really, to win all three trophies in a rugby league season. So you can tell where my motivations are. We win at Wembley. Um, and then it was the second out of three trophies that we were aiming for. You know, we 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 go to to do the treble, and I remember it was a game at Huddersfield. It was the day of my nana's funeral, so I drove over from Leeds over to Salford, went to my nana's funeral, spoke at my nana's funeral, and come back to Huddersfield on the evening to play what is going to be sort of a a massive game. And I remember going into the change rooms. Not really, not telling anyone what I'd been doing because I just felt like you don't do that, you know. You don't, you don't let that emotion out. You just go and do it on the field. Mm. Use it. Use it. Use it. And I'm going in, and I'm feel, I'm feeling shot to bits. I'm looking round the change rooms. There's all these old warriors in there, physically, mentally hungover from winning at Wembley a few weeks before. We've not won a game since. Sticking bits on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> strapped together by tape, arms strapped together by tape. Yeah. And I remember like looking around and obviously I've got these other motivations. I'm like, I want to go play for my nana here. And I'm looking around and everyone looks exhausted and I'm saying, look, we're going to have to put our bodies on the line for this. We're going to have to, this is, it's do or die now, you know. And I remember we'd, we'd gone out and we're playing so poor as a team, but I remember catching a ball, stepping through the line, jumping over the line, jumping up, celebrating, like properly celebrating because I had these other motives that people weren't aware of. And I was like, that's that's for my nana, you know? That's this, like. Yeah, this one's for nana. Yeah, yeah. You're just going, here we are, you know? And then it's to and fro in the rest of the game. We're playing really poorly. Um, and we need to win. Otherwise, the treble's gone. It's like gone. And we get to five minutes before the end. And I remember catching the ball, just thinking I need to get down the pitch here. I need to do something special um, for us to to do it. I go towards the line. I catch the ball, run towards the defensive line. And it's something or nothing, but my knee just, just capitulated underneath me. The ACL went, meniscus, cartilage, LCL went. And next thing, I'm I'm coming off the field, and I go and sit on the physio table, and I was like, "That's not how it's meant to happen." Mm. You know, it's like that's, that's not how I imagine this to be. Yeah, that's that's not, that's not how it's how it's meant to happen. And next minute, I had the 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 biggest roar from the crowd that I'd heard all night. We were behind at this point. And I'm like thinking, what's going on? The doctor runs in, he's like, Ryan Hall scored, Ryan Hall scored. And this is like one of the most famous tries in, in Super League history. Our winger had scored to win the game in the last dying second. And I'm like, I don't know what to feel now. I have mm. no idea what to feel. Get a better bonus, you know, <laughs> get a better bonus, but... <laughs> I was thinking, what do I do from here? Because this game plan that I'd been given of just solely throwing yourself into everything, working hard, dominating, mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't serving me, mm -hmm. you know? And from that point, I had 12 months out with that knee injury and I go to Thailand three weeks which is a massive massive cult shock for me I come home and just had this anxiety in me I just had this I, I felt like I was late for something all the time you know I felt this habitual tendency to feel anxious and I all of a sudden I started to feel empty you mm. know and for me that's when I started like opening up to something else. I had to open up to something else. And initially it was, 
to get back on the field, to be more successful, to achieve more. You know, that what can I do to be more? Get back to where I you know, was. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, but can I do yoga? Is that, that going to be better for my body? Is that going to make me get injured less? And probably a bit of it's driven by, you know, what's wrong with me here? What's mm -hmm. wrong with me? Like I said, when I was younger, what's wrong with me? These injuries, what's wrong with me? Why, why am I not superhuman? Mm. Why am I not bulletproof? Like, I'm doing everything and willing it, willing everything for me to be superhuman. I'm not successful as a superhuman right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, again, to be on that pitch and at the age you are, already again goes back to that minority of the minority of the yeah. minority right yeah and i felt safer i felt more at ease on the field mm. when the bullets are flying you know when the chips are down when when you're it, suffering when you're suffering when i was off the field i felt Anxious, nervous, doubtful, um, shameful. You know. What was the What was the shame? Well, shame is, you know, I am not who I should be. I guess that's how I felt. I am not. <clears throat> that's 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 how I felt. I am not who I should be. Hmm. Because I'm I'm out of the field. I'm I'm not playing. Um, I'm not impenetrable, you know. And I'm breaking. I'm not who I thought I was. Yeah. Yeah. And mate, the more and more of, especially over these last few years, well, that not who I thought I was then leads into who am I are the questions, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of who I was or who I am, I wasn't accepting, you know. Mm. It's hard to accept in a rugby league world that you're actually sensitive, you know, that I felt a lot. You know, sometimes in rugby league it's switch on, you know, get ready for this, switch on. Other times it's don't overthink it. You know, sometimes is it am I enough? Sometimes is it am I being too much? You know, where's it? Where do you where do you rest on? Where, where's the foundation? And you realise that actually, your mind's always going to be trying to find this find foundation. It's going to always trying to find this stronghold. Mm. Well, I guess in the, in change room versus outside the change room, either side of that. But in the change room, there's the switch on the immediate positivity of mm. getting out there and pushing down what might be the emotions that are coming up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then going out and then fully embracing what the battle is when you're out there. Mm. No room for any emotional distractions whilst yeah. in that. Mm -hmm. And then outside the change room and off the pitch, it's suddenly, ah, uh, yeah. feeling comes in, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes you'd feel cleansed after coming off the field, you mm. know. And I do miss that. Well, you, we got to hear some of that after the ice bath this morning, right? Mm. The yeah, roar, yeah, the yeah. yelling. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. Which is healthy. Yeah. Explosion, isn't it? It's like yeah. full exertion. Mm. So that's Thailand. Yeah. Where do we go so, from Thailand? Mate, I got back and um, I had all this time on my hands and this anxiety, you know, probably anxious, creative, sensitive type, you know, that sort of what I look back on now and think this anxiety wanted me to do something, I think, you know, and I ended up launching something called Mentality, which started as an online magazine for men, mm. men's health, men's mental health. And to use, help men use their mind, their mental health is the first point of address 
to be the best version of themselves. You know, that's what the first thing was. And and ultimately, mate, it was putting this thing out there, but it was me exploring it, you know? Yeah, it goes back to the, I guess, the curiosity of the boy picking up the rugby ball. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Because I felt at times we were only living one half of, of, of life. We're only living the go out, be brave, be strong, be impenetrable, which is a great tool to have, you know. But there's so much from deeply connecting with your teammates, you know. There's so much from being able to speak vulnerably. And I remember launching Mentality. It was, it was around 2016 and I'd put my an article out of my experience, how I felt, you know, how I felt emotionally in and around the injuries, in and around being out of the game. And I put it out there, I put it online, launched it online, I put it into a match day programme of the Magic Weekend, which is when loads of teams, all of the Super League teams, come to St James's Park over the weekend to play, to play each other, to play one game. Brave move. Yeah. What was I doing? Great, man. It's like it's real like, courage in there. Yeah. Right? It's the line, mate. It's, mm. it's like the defensive line again, I think. Mm. I put it out there and I'm, you know, I was listening to a lot of Kanye West and Kendrick Lamar at the time, mate. I'm like building up and I'm like, I'm just doing it. I'm just feeling into self. I'm just doing it. What I feel, you know, taking that risk. Well, what I feel and what I feel is right. Mm. How did that feel when you dink, when you hit send? Okay, now, how did it feel? Did it you just felt, go? Yeah. Or did, can I, was can I like, check it back? Uh, yeah, moment. Mate, it was. It was. It was exhilarating, mm. releasing as well. It was. It was. It was releasing on what I'd always thought I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like a bit of truth here, a bit of authenticity here, a bit of me. I put it out, man, and it got received so well. Got received so well. The intentions were good to yeah. for it's received well, right? Yeah. I believe so, yeah. A lot of depth in that message. Yeah. And, you know, he was talking about the experience of what I just touched on with my nana dying and being injured and in, in the last moments, missing finals and feeling that anxiety. Uh you know, there's, there's, there's these other players from other teams that I didn't know. There was on, on the Man of the Match interviews and they giving me a shout out about the article and talking about mentality. And I'm thinking, it was the first time where I knew that I could have an impact without being a rugby player. Mm. Do you know, funny enough. Yeah, because the, again, the who am I? Yeah. If I'm not that yeah. identity that's wrapped up mm. in rugby. Yeah. Yeah. Because underneath it all, mate, I think I have this tremendous drive, like just this drive that will go till death. You know, like if I'm out on the field, I'd, I'd be ready to die. But then on the other side, I'm sensitive, you know? Yeah, I was going to say, there's no doubt the warrior's there, right? Mm. But then we need to also be very mindful and nurturing of the other masculine archetypes within us, right? Yeah. The lover, the magician... Yeah. The king, right? Yeah. The crowning yeah. of all of that. Mm, yeah. So the lover, again, is we have to be aware and tuned into our emotions, mm. you know, so the warrior doesn't really just manifest into something else, right, which can then lead to multiple injuries and yeah. without the love for oneself or the care towards oneself that this mm. could be a repercussion of. Mm. And then you've got the wonderful magician within that, which is the imagining and reimagining of... Who we are. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, so launching mentality was probably a bit of a magician coming in. You yeah, know? yeah, exactly. A bit of magician coming in, not quite got to the lover yet, you know. And I don't know if it had ripple effects. It, it must have done somewhere just with how the universe works. But I remember 2016 was a really tough year for my team, for Leeds Rhinos as well. Like nearly got relegated after 2015. We won three trophies. We'd done the treble. We finished it. We completed it. So a massive achievement, all the rest of it. 2016 was like players left. You know, you've, you've got poor form and it just looked empty. You know what I mean? When you see yeah. a team play, it looked empty. And, and 2017 came around and, you know, we're in a 
a pre-season. And instead of going to Portugal, Australia or Florida, where we'd been previously, you know, it was a, it was a weekend in North Yorkshire. You know, so big budget, you know, <laughs> big budget. But we spent time biking, spent time walking, spent time around each other. And a lot of it was being herded into this big, long room with this roaring fire in the corner. And eight players had just been asked to speak in front of the team, you know. Not about anything in specific, just get up and speak about what you want. I think about six of the eight players got up and spoke about, and I used to say mental health, I used to say resilience, or I used to say um, depression. Or They just spoke truth. Mm. They just spoke truth. So you, been, is this, this is unheard of till this point, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like <clears throat> just... It was not something norm. It was not something like that was routinely done. You know, it wasn't. It, yeah. it was. It was. Yeah, it was. It was. It, it came from somewhere, and ultimately, mate. Like <clears throat> this is what I'm, I'm. I'm delivering with with the keynote talks and the leadership programs. What I, we'll talk about is the authenticity game plan. Mm. You know, because what what I felt in and around this this career that I had was yeah the. We need to be tenacious. We need to work hard. That's required. Full-blown intensity is required. But the way that our team played, especially that year, there was this openness, there was this trust, there was this, like, vulnerability. And there were, the way that we played was, instead of most teams where you'd land on a part of the field, maybe that's in line with one of the rugby posts, where you'd then shift to the corner, you'd put this beautiful expansive play on where everyone knows exactly where they need to be and it's all predetermined and then you get to the best part of the field and you do it back the other way, you know, it's like most teams were playing like that but the way that we was coached to play was when you get into that line, instead of falling and, 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 and finding a space where you predetermined need to be, all bets are off. If he gets an arm free, if he gets a quick play of the ball, all bets are off. You're going to need to do something that surprises not just the other team, but surprises yourself. And all of a sudden, mate, it's like some of the best performances we had were beyond what we could set our mind to. Mm. It was out of control. We were always trying to control things, especially in sport. We were trying to control things like... How fat's this bloke, you know? How much fat's he got round the the hips and, and, and how quick is he? And and you lose the faith. You lose the faith in it. And yeah, sometimes you, it's going to go wrong. But it brings people alive. People feel meaning. People feel like their own uniqueness is a part of this organisation, mm -hmm. is a part of what's going on. It's not just the values that have been written on the wall that no one even remembers and it's not you getting told what you should be. You know, it's allowing yourself to, to unfold into it. express what your unique gifts and talents yeah. are on that pitch in that moment. Yeah, it's inside out. It's mm. inside out. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And and for me, that's what it's that's what it's about. You know, I, I, don't, I don't go into place and talk about all these systems and procedures and everything that they know better than I do. I'm like, bring yourself to it. Mm. Bring yourself to it as a leader. Like, how can we understand shame? How can we understand ego? How can we understand all these things that we're so bothered about these systems out there, but we're not bothered about our own system that, mm -hmm. that, that works all of them, you know? And when you see a performance on the field, when you see a team play beyond what we've seen all year, when we see a football team, a rugby team, a boxer, and, and they compete at another level, the commentators say, oh, they've, they've took the shackles off for this one. I'm like, well, why do we put the shackles back on all the hmm. time? <laughs> do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are these shackles that, that, that we're putting on? And it goes for life as well, doesn't it? You know, I mean, I, I, I feel a lot of fear. I feel a lot of fear in life. Some of that's habitual. Some of that's what I've had to go through over the last few years. And 
retiring with a brain injury. And, and for me, those are the defensive lines. Yeah. Those are defensive lines that that are there for me to break through. Um, although I'm, I'm not going out there now. I'm not smashing through them on the field. I'm like, it's here, you know? They're like, Phew. take me away from heart. And they put me in my head. You know, I'm second guessing, I'm doubting. and But as I've always known, just get involved in the action. And then everything happens from there, you know? Mm. And, you know, coming in today and, and doing that. The note under the door. Yeah, the note to self, mm. you know? Get involved in the action and everything happens from there. Yeah, as we were discussing flow states earlier, right? Mm. And again, I'm... Fortunately, through certain systems we've gone through, it kind of colour our flow states, whereas if it's just allowed to have full expression and freedom, do we really need the length of time mm. that it takes all of us yeah. to reach that state? You know, back to mentality, it kind of resonates so much with sitting in men's circles, you yeah. know, and you have that thread, don't you, within the circle, mm. and once, like, your piece goes out, suddenly there's a recognition that, aha, mm. it's not just me yeah. feeling this. Yeah. And the other players then step forward and that's why they're celebrating you for the piece because, ah, yeah. like, oh, finally someone said it. Now we can say this yeah. and it happens in the circles, right? Oh. It can be maybe the first person sharing is a bit like, so why are you here? I'm yeah. here because, you know. And then the next one goes, but the next one really from a place of that authentic expression of why they're sitting there, then allows the freedom for each other within that circle to really celebrate why they're there. Yeah. And it is a celebration. Yeah. You know, shackles are off. Exactly. Yeah. Identification. I remember doing my first men's circle 2018, and it was after that year, 2017, and we'd gone through this thing, you do it on the field, you know, you... And in 2018, the start of that year, and, and having that feeling that, Probably the fellas have when they do the hacker, you know. Mm. You're hearing people talking on this like new level. Well, not new level, real level. The the one that's underneath all the rest of it, you know. People are sharing and people are open and you feel like you can do anything after it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And of course you know what I mean. And it's and I'm like, what when I'm experiencing all that. But then you go back and you put the the you know the top on, you put the rhino's cap on, and it's like it's not in the same place. So I'm like, why do we not just merge it all together? Mm. Like who, who are you gonna who are you gonna throw yourself in front of on oncoming traffic for? You know, on the field, like is it someone who you've seen to be vulnerable? It's so counterintuitive. But is it someone who you've seen to be vulnerable? Someone that you're like, this guy, this guy throws it in. This guy is literally put it all out there for me. I'm mm. going to do the same. Yeah, man. I, it's 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 so powerful. The men's stuff is so powerful. And I think you, it's a consistent thing which which people need as well you know it's not just like a flash in the pan i think it's yeah otherwise it becomes equal to a retreat yeah you know i i tend to not use the retreat word anymore mm. i like experiences mm. because it's like well what are we retreating from yeah yeah and i go on a weekend and i'm going back to what i was retreating from <laughs> Yeah. So it, back. It, yeah, so it is about the consistency, isn't it? Mm. So what's the uh, so okay, so I, so I in my head I had um like brain injury from rugby then mentality, but it's not. It's mentality yeah. and then that. So that's oh, interesting. Yeah. So that's already dropping in for you. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I don't know where I'd have been if uh if I didn't experience that stuff before. Before the brain injury. Because, yeah, the, the reason the confusion from my side, because normally it's something that's so traumatic in that mm. time that then we almost, we, we go through some, there's a rebirthing almost experience that then yeah. leads to that. So you already had tools and modalities in place. Mm. 
leading up to what then becomes a brain injury, right? Yeah. I felt, yeah, mate, when I launched Mentality back then, yeah, I was a bit lost with it. I was a bit, I was a bit like picking up these tools and still nearing back to get to injury. And, and I remember I'd, I'd um, pretty much that's how I'd met my partner, Natalie. She messaged me, she reached out, she had a friend that wanted to do a magazine. And she got in touch and like, oh, have you put this magazine together? And, you know, I go and I go and meet her and I kind of like, she was a professional contemporary dancer. So like similar in a way of the discipline, yeah, you know, yeah. the work ethic. <clears throat> Performance is very different, but... Well, the level of discipline it takes for anything. Actually, I like to feel, feel like we're dancing when I play it sometimes, you know? Yeah. Maybe you connected more with the lover and the magician, mm -hmm. you know, that stage, you know? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not thought of it like that. But yeah, she, mate, she's dropped me a line and eventually I start trying out yoga and, and meditating more and... You know, I meet this 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 woman who, for me, showed the absolute work ethic, discipline, hard work, like mental toughness, you know. But she was free, she was open. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, wow, what's that about? And She was like one of the first people where I could just feel like I could just fully let go with, you know? And mentality came. I built a relationship with Natalie. The brain injury came uh, after getting named captain and achieving what was a childhood dream, you know? that Those days when I was back on the field, running to the line, hearing my mum, it was like, next round I was captain, next round I was captain. And you're still super young at this stage, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 20, 26 when I retired, I got the brain injury. And, you know, if it weren't for Nat and it weren't for those foundations that we'd built and being able to, like, come out of that sticky perception of my world ending. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh because that's what it felt like a lot of times. My world was ending. Uh, I don't know what what I'd I'd be doing, to be honest. Mm. And of course, when you know you get the brain injury and I'm injured again, I always had this. You know, I've always had this sort of part of myself that's. It's like an extreme accountability, you know, like, where can I blame myself for this? You know, where can I blame myself to to find... So I guess it's like looking for certainty, you know, you're like trying to find some certainty with what's going on and ultimately I just have no idea. I, there's nothing I can do, you know? And you just got to, like, let go a little bit. Well, you've yeah. got to let go of it. A lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little bit, a little by little. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. And here we are. Here we all are. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Do you mind talking about the brain injury and how it came in and mm. what the concussion was and yeah, so um, I'd, I'd I'd I was I think we played two or three games. I had a great preseason and we came to a, a friendly at Wigan away at Wigan and um, I'm tackling one of their players, um, one of their lighter players, one of their fullbacks and trying to get him onto his back to actually get in, finish in a strong position. My head's in between his back and the floor. And before I pull my head away from, from underneath his back, um, one of our Tongan 130 kilogram players jumps on top like Smackdown and just fucking smashes, like smashes made in between the floor and, and his back. 
And I can get, I got up and I'm thinking, oh, my skull's strong, you know? Like, I think running, running around and carrying on, thinking my skull's strong here. And I got another bump um, from one of from one of their prop forwards in the se second half. Um, and then it was like, you know, two or three seconds sparky, feeling a bit out of it. And I ended up coming off just, just for something else, I think, in, in, in that second half. Um, and started feeling like nauseous, started feeling headache, migraine. Symptoms of concussion. Yeah, yeah. irritable. <clears throat> and I'm like thinking, no, please don't be concussion here. Do you know, like, don't be concussion. Anyway, I end up, you know, sort of telling the doctor and having, having rest. And then sort of going through the, the protocol to play again the following week. Um, and I'm back out playing, and this is like the first game of the season under the Friday Night Lights, and I'm leading the team out as a captain, and uh, I go in and I'm throwing myself about, but then you know, there's this one player that always used to come for me, he used to come and bash me to bits, <laughs> Gary Fellas, and he comes and, and he, his shoulder hits my right shoulder and his head just comes forward, and smashed into my right cheek, and that's where I got that big scar down my face. And blood's coming out, it's spurting out everywhere, and I'm all of a sudden coming off the field and I end up going back on to play. Um, but after that, man, and I've had shades of it before. After that was just migraines every day. Migraines, dizziness, nausea light sensitivity, noise sensitivity. And I'm in this, yeah, I'm in this like whirlpool of emotion as well. You know, I'm like, what's going on? Mm. I need to get back right. I need to get back right. And it just wasn't happening. It just wasn't getting better. And I give it six months to get better. And then by the time we got into six months, I'm like thinking, even if I do get better here, am I going to go back on and no, go through all through that again? Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So I retired. I, I made the call that I retire. And that was January 2021 when I officially retired. And since then, mate, it's been... It's been anger, it's been depression, it's been a bit of denial in there as well. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be all right, I'm all right, you know? Da, 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 I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And it's been this, yeah, this slow, slow releasing of, of what I thought that my life would be of mm. what I thought the rest of my career would be. I'd be in my prime now, I'm, I've just turned 30. I'd be in my prime and I'd be out playing. And Well, thinking that you'll be one of those older boys, and older men. Yeah. In the changing room, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. With the young 18-year-old coming in. Mm. Yeah, so... Yeah, the uh, the confusion of it as well was hard. You know, what if, 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 well, the, as we were discussing last night, there's the grief, isn't there? Mm. There's the grieving of that. Mm. You yeah. know, it has to come in that then you can fully be in the now or or who Stevie is in the room now, right? Mm. Grieving a lot. Mm. Grieving a lot. And there's, there's moments where... I'm seeing a body psychotherapist at the minute, actually. And, you know, 15, minute, 15 minutes of it, 20 minutes is a bit of talk. But then a lot of it is, I guess, a bit like cranial circle stuff. But yeah. <clears throat> he's, you know, he's well-rounded in, in, in more stuff with the body. And a lot of it is just putting attention to different parts, my head, anything that he, he gets directed to. And... I feel a lot of it in my chest, mate. I feel a lot of it in my chest. I feel this, like, tension. And it almost feels like it's... 
it's armor. It's armor that's like breaking. Do you know? It's like this old suit for protection. You know, you're coming up to that defensive line, the fear and doubt and questioning and but when I go through with it and when I grieve, when I cry, and I'm the other side of the line. Oh it's like Well that size said it all, right? Yeah. Mm. Freedom and the release. The relief. Yeah. Relief, yeah, and and, and it's okay. Mm. You know, it's all all right. And it's, it, it can be frustrating at times because every time you come back to the other side of the line, there's the, the same same old fear and stuff. But mm. Do you feel those periods of the freeing, the relief, the release are growing? Yeah. So the identity from this side of that line yeah. is reducing. 100%. Yeah. And, you know, this is... It's 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 the deliberation between attachment and authenticity, you mm. know, and the, the, t the two drivers, as Gabor Marty would say. And I'm in a place now where I feel the fear of not being attached. I feel the fear of not fitting into what I always wanted to to fit into, but I'm like, I'm 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 going I'm going into the abyss here. I'm 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 staying true to me. You know, I'm like, I want to be my authentic self, and it's it's a daily practice, mate. It's a daily practice, you know. But I'm well like, until it becomes, mm. you know, because there's. Again, masks that we put on, right? Mm. And it can be in different environments of where we are. Mm. <clears throat> and once you strip away all the masks, then then it is authenticity, right? Mm. Once you remove the armour from the heart, then it is authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And yeah. then that's so much more relatable for everyone. Mm. Yeah. And people, that's what people want to see in others. But they don't want to see it in themselves, you know. It's like it's wild how that works out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, man, the 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 stuff with the body work is, you know, the shades of dark is getting lighter, and the 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 sort of there's an expansion, you know, of of feeling more at ease with where I am and um like less heavy, you know. Mm. So. What are the modalities or practices you feel resonate most right now with where you are on this healing or path or remembering? I did a lot with ice baths and I still still do. Um Well we met at an ice bath at Yeah we did. Community. Yeah, yeah, yeah we did. Good place to meet that, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> in your trunks. Mask off, yeah. eyes on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You get to see really who we are in the, yeah. in those moments, right? Yeah, man. When you're just surrendering into that, it's good. So a lot a lot of a lot of ice baths. The one thing that comes to mind is dancing, you know. Mm. Dancing, shaking, dancing, roaring. Yeah. Just letting go, you know, putting music on full blast. Yeah, I, I'm so much on board with that. Mm. I, a lot of the experiences we put together, they're called experiences because yeah. that's ultimately what it is. We're here to experience, right? Mm. And again, the more rigid and linear we make this, the yeah. less experience we have. You take that all the way back to the earlier part of the conversation around training even. Mm. You know, think, what if we put dance into rugby training. Yeah, yeah. Wow, what could that look like? How much more elasticity and freedom oh, and right. explosiveness and rhythm and timing could I be putting in rather than um, push-pull movements on resistance machines, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, 
What yeah. about the full expression of that physicality? Rather that than being a coiled like? spring. Yeah. Yeah. What could it look like? You know. Yeah. And no doubt, you know, it's, it's throughout time we've had dance. Mm. and what can we reach within dance and mm. put a number of people together and that collective bonding from the hacker you get that when you put people in an ecstatic dance yeah you just feel it they don't need drugs and alcohol you build it and build it until that collective bondings come together and then we get to see an expression yeah you know see that's not off the table for me you know like if i go back into coaching they'd be the they'd be the the sweeping up into this place where oh, we need to do it like, you know, we don't want to put anyone, make them uncomfortable, you know, we don't want to rock the boat and stuff, but okay, well, that's that's what people ultimately, like you said earlier, they want to be able to be authentic. Mm. Everyone wants to belong. Wants to feel. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Longing to belong. How can we be a being without feeling... You know, otherwise yeah. we're a doing. Yeah. I'm a human doing. No, you're a human being. Mm. You know, time to start being human. Yeah. You know, I'll put music on. I'll, I can remember doing, doing a talk for Warner Brothers and I was getting into that mode where I'm thinking, preparing, planning, threatening, worrying, you know, doubting. And it just got to a point where I've just had enough of that. I've had enough of that. I went and got in an ice bath. I put music on full blast. Put Paramore, Ain't It Fun on. And just just dance, mate. Just mm. went with it. Just jigged with it. And then by the time I'm in this talk, I'm like, this is it. Mm. This is what it's about. This is all I had. Like, this is my moment. <laughs> just drop in then. <laughs> this is me. I listened yeah. to that a few times as well. Yeah. But yeah, man, I'm just... It's like when I was younger, going out and playing, you know, bit of Linkin Park, bit of flipping, dancing, bit of like being daft, go out, do it, you know. Mm. Yeah, man. So it's an interesting journey. It's one that I, I, I didn't expect to be on. Which I think it's, it. you know, it's more concerning when it's not an interesting journey. Mm. Yeah. You know, because it's in a way... It's all underpinned by curiosity, what you're discussing, right? You know? Yeah, which, again, that's being, going into that, thinking that's a practice alone. How do I really kind of surrender to that curiosity of mine? It's scary, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There's fear in that. Because if you see other people not asking those questions around you... yeah. What will others others think? Yeah, if what I, will others think? Yeah. What what am I going to look like if I do this? And that's outside the box. Yeah. But we want it on the field. You've got you got to be curious to be outside the box, right? Yeah. You want it in performance. You want you want to be doing the thing that's different. But then you're just like, as soon as you come off, no, get into line. You know. Where's mentality at now? So it's. It's there, in and around the injury, mate. You know, I, I, I was I was hitting mentality hard and fast because I'm like, right, okay, this is the thing. Obviously, I'm going to go into this thing now after finishing playing and there's all these levers and operations and all these different facets to it. And it was too much for me, mm. too much. Um, and, you know, ultimately about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I'm like, what do I want to do here? What, what what do I want to do now? What 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 am I feeling into? Do you know instead of just going into this sleepwalk, what what is it for me? Mm. And I can remember speaking, you know, first gig after I'd launched Mentality, I got asked to go and speak at places and twenty two, I think, was the first one I'd done and and I was like, I love it. I love it. It's natural. I get to say what I wanna say, you know. And it was just like this thing, and I look back and reflecting back on, that's the thing I love doing. This is where I want to take it, and what I want to talk about. I want to talk about authenticity, how that aligns with performance, how it aligns with fulfilment, and that's what I'm going to do. So the mentality is, it's got a counselling service now, which is still up and running. It's live. We've got amazing male counsellors on it. Brilliant. Yeah, and just top top men. 
And yeah, I'm sort of considering what shape it takes, you know, going forward. And I'm also giving myself a bit of time for me to learn, you know, come down here, mate, and, and just to listen to yourself. Mm. Looking at how you're doing things, how you're structuring things. And yeah, the speaking is is where my heart wants to go. And I think as well, alongside that is the coaching side of it. You know, I think that's that's what it's looking at for me. Do, do you see um, do you see yourself with what you know now, and perhaps an interest in coaching? Can you see yourself returning into the world of rugby with that? Yes, I can. There's a part of me that sees it and want to do it. And there's a part of me that's like, don't do it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's a part of me that's like... Because if you threw yourself back to 18-year-old Stevie Ward, mm. you know, with the tools and modalities you had now, what young Stevie Ward would benefit from that? I think I think the uh, the compassion and empathy that I'd have for a young player for an older player like I think that's what people are crying out for you mm. know with what's what what the sporting world is like for people you know what 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 actually consists of for people um you know we, I briefly mentioned yesterday, but you look in football and there's footballers that are they're having snus, so it's like tobacco and it's like these little parcels they're putting in the mouth and to just to numb themselves out. They're numbing themselves out of the moment, of what they're feeling. Difficult to be authentic then, right? It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's it's parking that for a mm. second, you know. You, you're parking Headphones it. Headphones on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, where are we going? <sighs> You don't. You're not doing. You're not growing up to do that, are you? You know, you're not playing football. You're not playing the game to carry out football well, and exist in and around what you. Where's think. even the word play in that? Yeah, there's no, there's, there's no play, and that's what in, in rugby, like, there's always a resistance to play to to carry the game out. It's play. Hmm. It's play. That's what people stand on the edge of the seats to to be around and to see and to be a part of. And it and it, it sort of gets lost in the mechanics of it all, and yeah, bringing the act of play or the the um, playful mind state that the mind can go into mm. in those acts of play, mm. playing rugby, yeah, yeah, playing football. Mm. I'm a, I'm a player, so it's like, well, what, what does that look like if we're kind of <laughs> numbed and dumbed out of the experience? I'm of, a player. What yeah. does that mean eventually? What does that mean? Yeah. yeah, I think I get tingles, mate, when I, when 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 up my spine when I have conversations with people in sport, you know, and of what's possible, you know, so. Yeah, you know, I've come to this sort of like feeling of like how much intelligence our body has compared to what our thinking conscious mind has, you know. So my body's speaking to me in a way. My body speaks to me when I'm having this body psychotherapy and mm. listen, I'm I'm completely trying to find a new relationship with my body. Completely trying to, you know, as we said at the start, trying to remember it and remember feel into it's all feeling, it's all instinct. You know, when I played when I was younger, you get a bit older and you're a bit... Well, that's, again, that's back to playing because yeah. it's that curiosity and the playful yeah. mind within it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, versus then the rigidity and the structured training and that kind of removes any playful act then. Mm. So to take that into the, the sporting world 100%, again. that's where I'd go with it. Yeah. Again, it speaks to the dance again, bringing routines and practices in that allow it to have that mm. that edge of freedom yeah expression and again working like we were working earlier right mm. 
we seem to think within within athletics even is that it's about and i see it in boxing a lot taking quite rhythmic elastic boxers and then turning them into like bodybuilders somehow mm. it's like oh we're going to put more strength conditioning in actually as i know i'm 48 and as we mature it's the things like the elasticity the timing the rhythm and the balance that go mm. yeah we're in an industry that thinks we just have to get stronger mm. and it's not that you can build strength work around it but keep working on the elasticity time and a rhythm mm. and balance work because that's what if you get divorced from that you can build as much muscle strength tissue and whatever you like on top of it but actually the framework's not going to perform that well you know yeah man. and that's 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 where i'd go with i think coaching in all athletic sports now we keep honing in on that keep honing in on that and then we have longevity right mm. you know it's the long it's the longevity um within a lot of high end or high pro or professionals within the game right mm. people retiring far too early right yeah and people are in pain you know yeah people are in pain and not as robust as they thought they were and but with huge physiques because mm. they've been doing lots and lots of strength conditioning work mm. Mm. and lose when we lose rhythm and elasticity and balance we lose timing yeah and timing is everything yeah and put that into rugby is timing important <laughs> well if you don't time a tackle or you don't time something then that's further collision constant right? yeah it's yeah. everything and coming out of the game actually i've i've trying to understand you know movement you know for better uh, for one of a better word exercise and and i've just not I've, i felt like i've not wanted to be in that linear ordinary like mm. or the the thing that i've just done time and time again i've just not felt I've not felt compelled to do it you know i've not felt a lot of the time i'm in pain my shoulders are speaking to me and saying that they don't want to do it and my knee blows up and I'm like, you know, do I just keep doing this thing? Do I just keep doing it? And Do just... I ignore the intuitive nudges yeah. telling me yeah, that yeah. I, in this, yeah. in this Stevie Ward that's learning yeah. about feeling? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. But then you go, oh, well, you know, you've always got to drive on and you've always got to go through pain. And so it's yeah. finding, you know, well, what is the, the flow of it? What's the balance of it? The movement of it that, that my body wants and, Likes a dance, mate. Yeah, I, I was just about to go into that. Just that's the intuitive nudge. If that's mm. coming up, that's what I'd go and investigate mm. most. Mm. You know. Yeah. And sounds like you have a great partner for that. Yeah, she's good. Yeah, yeah, she's good, <laughs> mate. She looks at me. You know, I start when I first doing it. I don't know if she's telling me the truth, but like, you she, you're pretty good. You know, you're pretty good contemporary dancer. And then now I've further progressed. I've advanced in that. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I am good at this. It's so interesting because Kieran, Kieran Lowe. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, he loves dancing. And actually, he's an amazing dancer. And he kind of, we talk a lot and and um, he describes this moment in his life when he's dancing in the bedroom. Yeah. And he's a young kid and his yeah. older brother comes in. And he has that moment of like, Oh, my God. What are you doing? It's crippling, isn't it? Yeah. And it's the same like, with our voice and it's the same all all this amazing ability to express ourselves somewhere we get shamed or something comes in and we again we put a lid on it so mm. yeah if there's a dancer in there man rewild that yeah you know yeah we talk rewilding right it's rewilding, like rewild your yeah. movement yeah, rewild yeah. your voice or rewild dance because it's tens of thousands of years we've been playing with that one round fire right yeah Kieran sent me a video of his dancing. He's flipping good. He I know is, he isn't is. He? Yeah, yeah. I used to, I used to be that. I, I, Did you? Yeah, man. I, used to, I, I got, I danced at the Wag Club. Um, I mean, it was a very different, very different environment then because it's you know lots of ecstasy and right, LSD yeah. and God knows what else. But yeah. um, <laughs> I could bust some moves back then. And again, I, I, I love it. Like the ecstatic dance that we hold, the ecstatic dances that we have. Mm. Um. And that's that's quite that's very powerful because again you're not using substance yeah to enable you to lose those um, inhibitions you know mm. 
bit like because that's what it is. It's short circuit into this <clears throat> place where you want to feel that freedom, isn't it? Yeah. It's like going through all those lines, all those yeah. straight to the straight to the end, and you're free. Again, you're, you're in a flow state, aren't you? Yeah. And again, it's an opportunity to really express physicality. You think of the shapes that you can make, and through the movement work, like I, I have an online program called Nat Life Tribe. It's a whole community, but the sessions aren't so structured deliberately, mm. and they're play. So there's an element of play within it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of quadrupedal work and all kinds of things. But the, the idea is that, for me, it's, again, it's about expressing the physicality. Mm. Because within macro movements that are huge, we've got these incredible vocabulary of movement and mm. ability to express ourselves on the ground, above the ground, in trees even, or whatever yeah. we want to do. But, again, within that, you suddenly see how insulting things like burpees and push-ups are to our physiology it's like why are you giving me this when i can actually do all this yeah you know and then we and then that is that would that not you know if you think about physicality and and its ability to express itself would it not bring in some kind of suffering if we only ever put through particular movement yeah, patterns course. over and yeah it has to mm. right yeah because the f fundamental need of movement an expression can't be met, mm. you know? It's it's by, in fact, limited by the movement structure that you're putting it in. Yeah, which is like caging it. Right? Yeah. Dunk, dunk, and, and So when, you, when you're running these sessions and stuff, yeah. because, the, because there's that element of freedom that you're trying to introduce and allow, you've done it a long time now. Yeah. But do you feel any element of fear and nerves for... Do you know what I mean? Like, are they going to drop into it? Are they going to allow it to happen? You know, like... Uh, I, I, yeah, okay, so I don't just go, bam, here you go. There's no. like within, let's say within the 100 human experience, let's say, I start people, like, we got 100 humans in in a circle, mm -hmm. and I start with, right, we're all just going to walk to the other side of the circle, and they just mm -hmm. start to walk past one another, you know? Yeah. And then the next stage is, right, you're just going to make eye contact with someone when you walk to the other side of the circle. So as soon as you get out to the circle, walk back in, make eye contact. Yeah, yeah. And the next thing is just brush a shoulder. And bit by bit by bit by bit, I'm just softening and softening and softening yeah, and softening. feeling safer. And... and then it's like, right, okay, now meet someone, give them a hug. Right now go to the other side of the circle and we keep going. And then eventually I bring them facing one another, just eye contact Mm. And that's so uncomfortable for many, yeah. just to be able to stare and like, and then I ask them to try and speak to that person through their eyes, almost right, and give them a compliment through their eyes. Mm. And then I bring in like eye to eye contact, right? If I move a body part, you move a body part, mm. you know. And if yeah, and we keep going like we're working in a mirror, yeah. And then don't show someone what you already know. Try and so show them something that that you've never played with before perhaps mm. and then wonderful things start to happen and shapes start to make sh take shape yeah um and then you find people moving through an act of play then mm. in ways that they probably haven't since up until the age of five when they were first put into a chair in a classroom for a number of hours and it's phenomenal really to uh, for the observer like i'm observing yeah. that but when they then come out of that experience, their minds are blown as well. It's like, yeah. oh my god, I haven't moved. I haven't moved in that range. I haven't been doing this. And imagine you're taught not to squat with your hips any lower than your knees or your knees beyond mm -hmm. your toes. But suddenly you're down on the ground making these extraordinary shapes. How releasing that is. Yeah. You know, and for some, just the movement and the play, and they perhaps think that the ice bath or the breath work or this is going to be really kind of the profound experience for them and it can just be accessed through movement mm. and play mm. so it's about building it and even on the online stuff it's again we start with like how do you put weight in your hands right how yeah. do you understand your yeah. weight in your hands now get used to where your weight is and tune into what we were working with this morning with your feet mm -hmm. so like being aware of where your body weight is where mm. your supports are and not working on tensing muscle groups or tightening your abs. Actually, forget all that. Just understand where your weight is. Okay, now lift one hand. What impact does that have on the other hand? Oh, I've just increased my body weight. Yeah. And then I'm making them curious as to where their weight is. 
what about if you lift one hand and then what happens to the back leg oh my leg gets lighter okay lift that leg and mm. then suddenly we've got we're on we're in like a start of a quadrupedal crawl yeah right do your abs on yeah okay well i haven't told you to tense your abs but now they're on do you get it now put your hands down are the abs relaxed yes mm. so they're teaching them where support is the sophisticated movement system that we have can understand its role rather than us hijacking it mm. and going right here's a tricep extension <laughs> yeah. right now tense your abs and pull your belly button in now fire your glute and extend your leg and no animal in the animal kingdom would be doing that mm. because they just move in what we could say is is it not just play yeah or flow or whatever yeah. it is so with me earlier you're looking at my mechanically adapted movement aren't you really mm -hmm. you know when i was doing the the hip lock or the you're telling me to untuck it i'm I, i've been tucking it yeah for you're tensing your abs yeah. and tendon it's not yeah. actually your hip joint needs to understand freedom i look at it like this so the imagine the foot's a very stable foundation and the ankle joint is a mobile joint and the knee's very stable the hip's very mobile the pelvis and the lumbar is very stable which we mm. call core stability right then you have your mid-back and your thoracic spine that's actually really mobile. As we started to free it up mm. earlier, right? As this um, incredible extension, flexion, yeah. rotation. And then the neck's very stable. Mm. Um, what you were doing is kind of ten tensing the abs and tucking everything in yeah. for finding core stability. But actually, if the areas like the hip and the thoracic spine understand their role, then the core will be stable. Like what I play with people on the ground, essentially mm. by... Years and years ago, back in the day, I had a Pilates studio and I used to make this so complicated through that. Really? It's like, right, you place your hands on the ground, your knees underneath your hips, right? I want you to tense your belly button, tense your pelvic floor, pull your belly button in, breathe out, extend your opposite arm, opposite leg to get this activation. And then years on, it's like, no, just focus on where the points of support are and then just lift one hand, lift one foot, and that's already on. Mm. But you know so yeah, yeah. what you what you were kind of working through earlier was tensing everything when actually if you just relax that area and allow the range to off be offered from the hips mm. and you started hip hinging yeah you know so you'll have a, a real understanding of how intelligent the body actually is compared to what our mind tries to put it through or tries to adapt it to I, was your I don't think we've re really given our minds or our bodies a chance to. Mm. And again, I bring this back into, I'm quite vocal on this and I put it in my book, but uh, we go into a certain system at a certain age mm. and up until a certain point, you're very playful and expressive. Um, and then if you really strip it back and like we have, we have no chairs in the home, so you ground live. So therefore those more complex movements that we were discussing like standing walking running jumping lifting they're only as good really as the foundational movements so if we keep working on the ground each ground rest position and there's a lot of ground rest positions yeah. that you can move through keep those areas of the body that should be mobile and the areas that should be stable offering their roles mm -hmm. and it keeps nurturing then the more complex movements of the standing, the walking, the running. So the foundational movements need to be honoured. We go into a certain system where we're very playful and expressive, and then we're told to sit still. We were unpacking it earlier. Where, um, stop fidgeting, mm. you know? Well, maybe the children fidgeting are trying to show you something that mm. they need to move, not sit still. Yeah, trying to regulate themselves. Yeah, or we're looking out the window, because again, is it not, for my mind, it seems it would be quite traumatizing to a physicality that that is so expressive to have it sitting for long periods of time and then being told not to fidget. It's like being put in, that's a really strict box you're mm. being put into. And then you could say, well, then you're being told to sit still and be quiet. So then you remove the voice mm. and we're talking about being authentic and expressive. So you've removed that. So I can't express my physicality. I can't express myself verbally. And then, and 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 then we're given a small window of time to go and do all of that, which is the playground, right? Mm. 
which is then adult supervised and almost adult led, whereas really it should be child led because yeah. you're allowing them to free freedom of expression. And it's a set time frame. And then that is then removed and we create PE. Mm. And PE then becomes the burpee, the push up and the push pull movements yeah. that we then perceive is how that's that's oh wow well that we can do this this is our expression of our physicality this is physical education yeah physical. it's pe right yeah and 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 then over time you either walk into that lesson of pe with raw talent or you're one of the older ones within that mm. in the year the school year um where you're going to excel at that and the others go i'm no good at that mm. so therefore I'm now back on the chair, back on the couch, and thinking that I don't have this amazing vocabulary of movement that I could possibly be expressing. Yeah? And then we go from there. It could be, right, now you're going to go and play rugby, right? And you've been sitting for so many hours, right, straight in, put your kit on and out on the pitch. Get your boots on. You know? Pick your teams. Yeah, but we've been sitting in a position that compromises the way that we would move naturally, yeah? Because the complex movement of running in rugby, there's crawling in there, there's jumping in there. They're all complex movements, but again, they're only as good as the foundational movements, and chair sitting isn't a true foundational movement for this, full expression of what it is to be human. It's pretty, it's pretty full on, isn't it? Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's triggering in a yeah, way, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. Fuck, yeah, but that's really where it's at. Yeah. And it feels, you know, coming down here and I've only been here not even uh, 24 hours, but seeing your children, you know, the way that they move and how natural things are and they've got, like, that bite to them as well, you know? They've got that bite to them. They're just... They're not... They're not they're not hankered down. Mm. They're just they're just free flowing and they're just led by what they want to do. And it's been really nice to see it, especially in this environment, in the nature, and how you and Katrina. It's like, yeah. I mean, it's it's moving. Yeah, you you a movement yeah. guru, mate. Do you know what I mean? But it's like the the lifestyle of it as well. Mm. It's, well, movement it's not, is. Again, it's just one of the one of those physical needs, right? Yeah. And again, like back to right, but take it back to coaching, right? Mm. Stevie is the coach. And let's look at the so out outside of being on the pitch. Cause talking of like we think about performance and recovery. I did a uh keynote at mm. this um at a bank I went into, right? And it was around I I presenting around performance and recovery but bringing this understanding of lifestyle into it right and to be able to perform on a pitch we also need to be looking at well, what's the recovery what's the true sense of what sleep is what the true sense of rest is yeah. what foods do i need ultimately to nurture that mm. and the who is that unique gift and talent on the pitch as to what they need as an individual versus this is the program this is the structure and this is what you should all be doing yeah one size fits all. You know, how was that back then compared to where you see it is today? Because, you know, there, there's so much information out there around sleep. There's so much yeah. information around their nutrition. How much is that is reaching um, the players? Yeah, I remember we had a physio, um, Ben Harper, who was doing a, sl a big sleep study. And we used to play a Friday night and uh, you'd be jacked up on caffeine, you know, you, you, you the adrenaline of the game. You're finishing playing... 10 just before 10 p.m mm -hmm. and you're going home and you're trying to get a wink of sleep it's not happening it's no. not happening you know we used to come in saturday we used to come in saturday morning um 9 a.m and we're doing gym we're doing weights and like we're going to the pool and you know you're doing the video review and stuff i'd be like that ah. like me, me sandbags over my eyes because i've not slept you're feeling mentally exhausted I think now they're starting to understand that I think actually sleeping is probably not a bad idea here, you know, especially if you've if you've you've been playing into the night. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's like 
it, yeah, because it seems so obvious, right, from the yeah. outside, like the, yeah. just the common sense of it. It's like, okay, because, you know, I, I know a lot around sleep because, of course, I, I run a coaching cert and part of it is one of the days we hone in on the evolution of the diet, the digestive system and mm. sleep mm. and understanding there's like an anabolic phase and there's a catabolic phase. You know, when we are in this state of replenishing regeneration versus when we're in a state of breaking down. Yeah. And 80% of human growth hormone is produced between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Mm. So where's the best sleep right, as a regeneration? Bit, yeah. You know, it's going to be between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. When we're wired after this game, yeah. looking on Twitter and you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and then you know, and then what I then discovered was like, ah, for human growth hormone, you need melatonin within that to trigger yeah. that human growth hormone. And again, when we're exposed to certain spectrums of light that we know, which we'd be getting through our screen, especially if you're on Twitter and doing what mm -hmm. you're doing, that that then suppresses that melatonin, which then would affect the human growth hormone cycle. So it's like, oh my god, when you when you unpack that, yeah. So it's like, what could I do if I finished at 10 p.m. on the pitch? Okay, I could have right, players straight into amber glasses so we're not getting mm. hit by that. Mm. Down-regulation practice, can we get you into breathing to down-regulate your system before this? Mm. You know? Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a part of it, and I, it's like... Um, how, how, do you, how do you put all these things in place where it's the skeleton, you know, where it's like the skeleton of a team going through the schedule, going through this process, going through the season. Mm. And how do you keep that faith? You know, how do you keep that courage for for a player? Mm. You know, how do you? For me, that's like the mix. That's the that that's that's the magic. You know. And I think I think back about you know the 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 environment and it was such a tough environment. It was such a rewarding environment, and it was an environment where you threw yourself into it. Mm. But you could you could almost get a, bit, a little bit lost. Do you know what I mean? You could almost get a bit lost along the way. And I always for my talks, I always use like this like. Um, this piece of beautiful clean A4 white piece of paper I use and I say, you know, this is me when I was young. This is mm. me at the very root of it when we're curious, we're adventurous, we're brave, you know, we're, we're, we're resilient, you know, all of that natural stuff there. And then I talk about that, that those moments with my mum, you know, you, you, you're scared to set her off and you're scared to, to say something to use your voice mm. and say something that might trigger that, that situation that's going to just make it a nightmare for you you know and it's going to trigger um a rubbish week you know and i think about the moments on the field and, and i you know i mentioned it earlier where there's that immediate reaction to not to cry you know if you feel emotion quite like when you get smacked on the nose mm. Don't cry here. I remember that in playground. I got got a whack on the nose. You're like, oh my god, I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna go. <laughs> don't cry. Don't cry. You know, those moments and and you're almost like just folding. It's like a fold. It's like you're closing off that part of yourself. Do you know? You just you just you, you're relegating that part. I guess that's the shadow, and I guess that's the part of yourself which you feel is not acceptable. Mm. You know. And you just A four to A five. A four to A five, mate. And, and and I go through my story and I'm like all I'm folding it and I'm folding it and you people in the audience are like Whoa, the feeling I, I imagine and identifying with where they where they've done it, with where they've not been acceptable, what they've said has not been acceptable. You know, and you're folding this paper and it goes through my story and Well, that's engineering smallness. You know, mm -hmm. it is engineering smallness, and I don't know much about engineering. Insignificance. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, and I, I'm still, I'm, I'm like this little small cardboard esque piece of paper, where I feel like all the expectations for how I want the world to go, for how I want to feel, how I should feel, are all in a big long list. Mm. My 
this my personal reality it's my it becomes my personality and i end up you end up with this like expectation of how everything should go and and it's straining it's a struggle you know it's like it's hard work to 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 stay as that and, and you might win you might win something and i and i won so many trophies that i'd aimed for when i was younger you know oh, with the rhinos captain i want to win these trophies and i want to um win grand finals and i want to play at wembley and and you have the success but i remember like feeling like like that mm. that small version but it's it's so natural and i think you're touching about it in school where it's it is a natural survival thing to fold, to close off, you know. To conform. To conform, yeah. It's it's a natural thing. Yeah. And until you stop and go, why am I not listening to that music anymore? Mm. You know, why 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 do I feel like it's strange to move my body outside this linear pattern? Mm. You know, and it, it's all... And it, it, it's all in the way of what you think it's supposed to be, or you think. You... Well, there's fears that come in. I mean, and it brings it back to survival in a way, right? So it's for safety, isn't it? Really, for safety. Because imagine you're in a, you know, you're in small bands of communities, mm. tribes, and your fear is being abandoned. Because abandonment would mean. You know, it could mm. be starvation, it could be death, it could be mm. whatever exposed to whatever yeah. elements and the yeah. safety of the community. So therefore, but the, the difference in community is there's common unity there. It serves mm. and we get our physical, social, spiritual needs met. Um, and But if I don't conform, then there's a risk of being abandoned. Yeah. So what we can find is that we would perhaps take on even beliefs and behaviours that aren't serving us or aren't growth promoting in the fear of being abandoned, mm. ostracised. I guess that's where I'm not enough comes from, isn't it? Yeah. You, you need to be enough <clears throat> to be around. Yeah, again, that comes down to the, and that's the internal language, right? Mm. You know, that we were discussing earlier, like the praising model, you know, where does that come in? Here's a gold star for your yeah, great yeah, behaviour. Yeah. yeah. You know, rather than I am the gold star. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what, I believe I am need... the gold star. I don't need yeah. five of them. Yeah. You know, or I am enough, or I am loved rather mm. than seeking outward for love or mm. um, the praise of which we're in search of, or the people pleasing that we're in search of. Because mm. again, within those environments that we all entered at a very early age and didn't leave until about 16 years later or whatever it was yeah, yeah. we were in a system like that yeah how do you feel now being 54 <laughs> we had that earlier <laughs> yeah that's it podcast <laughs> over <laughs> 48 yeah, yeah, yeah 40. Yeah. how do you feel with it all now like you know you've you've had a Man, an incredible life, mm. you know. How are you feeling with all that? Do you still feel those folds? Do you still feel the fear of coming up to these folds, these defensive lines? You know, like where's that for you? Um, round about thirty-eight, thirty-seven, even. Yeah, I took a saw to my sofa. Wow, and put it up on YouTube, right? It's just like I'm done with sitting furniture. I know too much. Yeah. And it got to that point where I had so much information. Like again, we we're information rich, but experience poor. But again, wasn't so, so much in there wasn't so much of an embodiment of it, I guess. Mm. It was knowing it, but the true authenticity was the actual being it. Mm. And so I couldn't have all that knowledge and and not be living it was I yeah. think where it came in for me. Mm which would, in theory, being living a lie in a way. Oh, you know this, but you're not adhering to it or owning it or living it, so therefore it's not authentic. And mm. what we're doing, putting this message out, but not living it. Mm. And um, I fully surrendered to it at that moment. Yeah. And it meant an element of being ostracised or abandoned, I would say, yeah. from what, my, what I perceived my... Um, my within my social needs being my family my friends my local community yeah. 
but then from the wider kind of community that were then seeing this out of that grew new friends new community yeah and enabled me to fully kind of own my role within that community yeah which then was an authentic role within that community which then meant I got to fully kind of express who I am and what my unique gifts and talents are, which then led me to do many other things. Right? Yeah. So I'm really at peace with it. And what I found through that is who perhaps where there was a, a, a little os being ostracized or abandoned through those social networks, they've come on board over time. Mm. The same ones. Yeah, but largely yeah. because what I've been speaking to for a long period of time is becoming more and more and more normalised now. Yeah. Like so many more people wearing barefoot footwear, so many people yeah. being barefoot, so many people being in nature or nature mm -hmm. immersed, and so many people doing breath work now, so mm -hmm. many more people getting in the cold. So, you know, it's, so it's yeah. it's um, not so socially extreme, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think it's very important to... We were talking in the kitchen last night, I think, wasn't it, about, or it might have been this morning, about flow and drift, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, you know, it's underpinned by intention, but for me it's, I balance it between is it growth promoting or is it compromising? Mm -hmm. And the direction I want to go in is if that was a divergence, I want to be moving towards growth promoting. And... I'm not going to sacrifice my own health and well-being for the sake of another yeah. in that sense or what they yeah. might think of me. And then that is underpinned by it's none of my business, really, what other people think of me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're in a good place with that. I'm in a really good place. Yeah. You know? That's great. I feel at, I, I'm in a much better place than when I was 38. Mm. And I'm in a much better place than when I was 28. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'm probably in a better place when I was than when I was 18 because I joined the army at 18. Yeah, as a form of kind of escapism and yeah. what I perceive might be, you know, a, a route out of something. Mm. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, like we're often asked. You know, I I, I ask uh, often. I more often I ask this: is that do you see? You know, all that happened to you is actually happened for you, right? Mm -hmm. Is there is there that language that is that within? Mm -hmm. And for me, it's very much like it's exactly how it's meant to be. Yeah. And therefore, how could you not be um, happy with that? Yeah. I think, you know, with the unfolding of that paper for me, I'm not fully there yet, by the way. I don't know when I'll ever be fully there, but... I think there's the, with that unfolding is coming away is the expectation, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that you hold and, and the sort of like clinging on to what it should be and how it should feel and, you know, it's, 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 It goes back to what you were saying earlier. It's an interesting journey. And, like, I don't want to be living a journey where it's not going anywhere, do you know? Because by definition, you, you should be changing, you should be moving, you should be adapting, letting go, you know? Uh, well, the same curiosity that led to picking the ball up, you know, who's to say that curiosity isn't beyond putting the ball down? Yeah like that you know yeah I've written, we write that down for my next talk <laughs> <laughs> got the ending for my talk yeah, but it's man. there right because there's there's it's that it's that's what I would say if we were to talk about unique gifts and talents it's there right it's mm. in the curiosity what's it like if I do this yeah what if this yeah you know what if rather what than if? Oh, what if I do this? Yeah. You know, what what about if curiosity underpins the what if? Mm. Yeah. What if the curiosity underpins the who am I? Yeah. You know? That's so when I when I seen that Ram Das, um, listened to a lot of Ram Das, and he's just talking about we're all just walking each other home, mm. you know. And I think about 
getting through that line and seeing that try line and I was like, oh my God. That's when I felt at home, you know. Just not necessarily being over the line, but just going towards it, just moving towards it. And it's just like, I just got to keep following that, you know. Yeah, like the one step, one breath and being in every moment of that mm. because the line's forever moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And what if the line has a huge convex and a huge concave to it? Mm. It looks like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Because sometimes it feels like we go, ah, oh, but then woo. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. have these moments within it. Yeah, that's definitely been my experience over the last six months, 100%. There's been some real dark moments, you know, some like languishing mm -hmm. like, oh, for spells of time, you know, periods of time. And, and then there's been these breakthroughs of light and clarity, you know, I felt it and it's been wonderful, better than I could imagine. And then it's been back into the the cave of it all and... I, I've learned to. This is the. This is interesting because in the in the, I, have, I have a men's group called Man Men, and within the group, the guys were asking how on the last event I just did this Man Men March for November, mm -hmm. and I did day thirteen. The winds were like completely crazy, and my no day thirteen. I'm out there saying I could do this every day. Just get yeah. up and do a marathon every day. Day fourteen, the winds were completely crazy, and it kind of flipped my legs, and I landed awkwardly. And doesn't matter how good my foundational movements were or my understanding of running or running technique, the winds had other ideas. Yeah. And however I landed, it just, ugh, anyway. But it tweaked the ankle. So I, I had a cankle where the calf and the ankle have a baby and it looks like a mm. cankle. I, can I always have one of them. Like an elephant's <laughs> foot somehow. You <laughs> yeah, don't, you yeah, don't yeah. even have an ankle joint. You can't yeah. see it. And... Um, of course, I'm then in the cave, right? And the guys in the group where I'm voicing to, asking for help, they're like, I don't understand how you how you flip it and stay positive within it. Mm. And it's because over time, I would say, I have had the most valuable lessons in that cave mm. that I've come out and I've definitely become stronger for it. I've definitely become more resilient through it. I definitely have more mental fortitude for it. Mm. And I've, I've I've gained wisdom, I would say, mm. something that's really enabling rather than disabling, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So then it's it, the more you visit it, in a sense, the more you're not always in there because you know there's light. There, I don't have to look at the back of the cave. I can look yeah. at the light, and then if I venture out there, I always know I can get out of the cave. Yeah, you know, and it's how long you personally want to spend back there. Mm. You know, and sometimes I actually. Yeah, come on, let's sit back here a bit longer. I haven't quite got the message yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And then it feels less like the dark place in a way. Mm. And that's how it can be flipped to be quite positive. Ah, I, I learned so much stuff back there. I think that's why voluntary suffering is not a bad thing, you yeah. know? First thing in the morning with the sun and the ice bath and exercise, whatever you want to do. Like, even if your mind's telling you, no, nah, don't do it, don't do it, don't mm. do it. Do it. And it's, it's, it stops you venturing towards it for experiences in life that might throw you into that. Mm. Otherwise, you know? Yeah, I think there's, again, it's the cave or the discomfort, being uncomfortable or finding comfort then eventually in what was previously perceived as discomfort mm. because we're venturing along a path where our world is becoming more and more comfortable. Yeah. You know, yeah. think of the comfort that we have today versus five years ago, 10 years ago. I remember growing up when pretty much dads at this stage, but nearly all the dads are out washing their cars at weekends, right? Mm. And then eventually they're all driving their car to the car wash at the weekend. Oh, yeah. You know, and then think of the comfort within the car, how that compared to back then. That's just the car. And then strip it back. Right? At one point we were walking. At one point we were doing this. So one what point we, we were perceive, going out to the shops and yeah, now we're getting it delivered. And, yeah, and what we perceive as resilience yeah. today, what resilience was back then. So that's why it's so valuable to play with discomfort yeah. and the edges of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
for a modern, very convenient, very comfortable world. Because what if it keeps getting more comfortable and we keep just adapting to the comfort that we have? You pulled yourself out of it, didn't you? You yeah. literally pulled yourself out of that that wave towards comfort. Do you know mm. what I mean? You, you, yeah, yeah. You took yourself out of it. It's a conscious decision. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking how many people need to do that, you know? Like, where's where's the ability to keep fading in and out of that comfort, you know? Like... Yeah. Well, we uh, the, the footwear in the kitchen, right? Mm. You know? So we look at that and you have a big bit of cushioning behind the heel. Yeah. And if you were to jump up and down on a really hard surface, it's you that has to give, right? Mm. But if you put a great big piece of rubber between you and the hard surface, it's the rubber that gives. Mm-hmm. And you lose your amazing ability to be really elastic. Yeah. Yeah? And so... You put Vivos on for a, a moment, already it feels like, oh, there's, wow, they feel quite big because there's loads of space in there. So it gives your, oppor- your foot an opportunity to really open up. Mm. Then it gets to express its physicality, yeah. which means that feeds so much more within your capabilities. Your joint actions will benefit from it. But it will be uncomfortable for mm. the beginning because you've put so much almost like bubble wrap between you and the earth. Years right? of it. Yeah, years of it, and what we disconnect from in that process, mm. but we perceive we need it. You know, I need to get onto them, mate. Yeah, man, I'm gonna. I'll hook you up. I'll hook you yeah. up. The guys at Vivo. Yeah, Vivo barefoot. Save get Stevie me. Wardson. He lo- really likes the Gobi boots. By the way, <laughs> he tried them on here and he loves them. Yeah, those cowboy boots. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh man, I need just let my feet just get get them free. Let me break out and. Because, mate, that's like, you know, with the vestibular stuff we were talking about earlier. Like, yeah, man. Yeah. Again, okay, let's let's shake it up. Let's let's bring it back down to earth, you but, know? But, but, but work on that whole system. So 10% visual, 20% vestibular, mm. 70% proprioceptive. And if you're standing up, that comes through the soles of your feet. Mm. And the more rubber you put between you and those feet, the more you dumb down that 70%. Mm. You know? And the more then overactive other areas have to be almost to compensate for the lack of yeah could learn a lot from you mate oh we're always learning a lot from each other right <laughs> yeah I think hopefully you know curiosity yeah keep that curious keep the cup of curiosity empty empty keep filling it all yeah man mm. I'll drink to that yeah I'll drink to that brother that's a good place to finish man. yeah man Thank you, sir. Remember, curiosity to lift the ball. Yeah. Yeah. And what was it? Put it down. Don't put it, don't ever put it down. What was it? No, the curiosity to lift um the curiosity to lift the ball I used to say um there isn't curiosity beyond putting the ball down. Yeah, that's it. I think that was it. That's it, yeah. Might have to edit over that, Simon. <laughs> Damn it. Hey man, that's about Balls a down. Great Cheers, stuff. brother. Oh yeah. As always, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you feel drawn to do so, then please subscribe to the show, leave a review, and don't forget to share. Sharing is caring. It really helps me to help others. If you're drawn to immersing yourself in any of the NatLife experiences or see yourself as a NatLife coach, head to TonyRiddle.com for details of how to immerse yourself in the community. You can follow my adventures on Instagram at The Natural Lifestylist. Big shout out to Simon from We Are The Clarks for producing, filming, editing. Much love. Much love.